Hi, welcome back to Ask a Creationist. I'm Todd Wood. I'm president of Core Academy of Science. I'm a young age creationist, and I'm here to answer your questions about creation, evolution, the flood, the fall, Tower of Babel, whatever you got. We're interested in hearing from you. Let us know what your questions are, and maybe we will feature you on a future episode of Ask a Creationist. This week's question comes to us from a viewer who wants to know, were all fossils formed by the flood? Now, if you've read books from creationists, apologetics books, or books on you know, creationism, or you know, the flood, or whatever, you've probably seen this version of this claim, some kind of, you know, maybe not explicitly said, but it's sort of implied, that really the only way to explain the fossil record is the flood. The flood is the explanation for how the fossil record is the way it is, and it has the properties that it does. And there's lots of ways that we sort of give this message to people reading our books. And I haven't here quoted anyone. I usually like to quote people when I'm going to talk about things that people have said, because I like to be clear that I'm not just making this up. But I think that this is a common enough statement, a common enough claim, I don't really need to quote anyone, and frankly, I don't really want to pick on, any, pick on anybody because I feel like this is, this is just folklore. It's been around in creationism for at least a century. The idea that the flood is the explanation, is the explanation for the fossil record. But ultimately, I do think it's more complicated than just the flood caused the fossils. And certainly, there are fossils that look very much like they were deposited in some kind of watery catastrophe. Maybe that's a future Ask a Creationist. Give some examples of that. But here I want to focus on other fossils that look like they might be something else. In particular, the fossils of the Green River Formation. Now, if you haven't heard of the Green River Formation, it's pretty crazy, amazing, and wonderful, and I'm sure you have seen, at some point in your life, a Green River fossil. I'm talking about Fossil Butte National Monument, which is located in southwestern Wyoming. That is Fossil Butte there. And it is the source, the, the National Monument itself, and many of the surrounding areas are the source of fossils that look like this. They're exquisitely preserved. There's thousands of fish that are preserved in these sediments along with bats. As you can see, there are birds there. We have reptiles, things like uh, turtles and snakes. We have plant fossils. We have even stingrays there. And these are all exquisitely preserved. These particular fossils are on display at the visitor center there, and you can see them at Fossil Butte. And they're amazing. And you even have examples of what appear to be one fish eating another fish. And you can see, as you look at this, this fossil, it's just gorgeous preservation. How could this possibly be this, you know, the standard story of some creature dies and floats to the bottom of a peaceful pond and gets buried and over many years and so forth. And how does that make sense of this? This looks like he was having a snack and in the middle of the snack, he got buried and there was no way that anything could get in and disturb his body or the body of his victim. And so this speaks of a catastrophic, watery catastrophe, right? Well, as I said, I don't think it's quite that simple. So if we look at the geography here of Fossil Butte National Monument, as I said, southwestern corner of Wyoming, close to Idaho and Utah, the Green River, which the Green River Formation is named for, runs from the north to the south towards the Colorado River. It's a major tributary of the Colorado River. The Colorado River then empties into the Pacific Ocean and goes right through the Grand Canyon. So this is the geography of that. Now the layers of rock that you find at Fossil Butte National Monument are not just sort of random rock layers in which you find fossils. There's a pattern to them and it's a really striking and amazing pattern that everyone talks about when they talk about these fossils. There's basically a series of what appear to be concentric rings of these rock layers in which these fossils are found. So what's special about the rings? Well, if you look at the kind of outer margins of these rings, the, the outside edge, you find certain characteristic things that you don't find on the interior. You find ripple marks. You find more terrestrial fossils. The, the fossils of land creatures, land animals, occur around the edges, but not towards the interior. The worst preserved fish fossils 
are the ones found on the outer edge. Towards the center is where you find those really pristine and amazing fossils. Out on the edge, you find thicker laminae, which laminae are those tiny, thin little layers that make up the, the fossil layers that you find these fossils in. You also find, on, in addition to having thicker laminae on the edges, you also find more laminae on the edges. And you find what we call stromatolites. These are basically colonies of bacteria that grow on big humps of rock that they basically make themselves, and they grow in shallow water environments. And you only find stromatolites here in this area around the edges, the margin of this big deposit. So what is it that we're looking at? Well, honestly, it looks like a lake. It looks like exactly what you would expect from a lake. The ripple marks on the edge, that's from the water lapping at the shore and making ripple marks. Or it's from water coming in from streams, depositing water, bringing water into the lake. The terrestrial animals would be the things that would be along the shore of this thing, which is why you find more terrestrial fossils on the edges than in the middle. And of course, the stromatolites also would be things that you'd find on the, sh could find in shallow water on the shore of a lake. But if we take a cross section through this, this is where I think you get this real, really good sense of what's happening here. So this is sort of a cross section of the geology. The, the layers in which you find the, the kinds of fossils that you find at, at Green River Fossil Butte are shown in brown on the top there. That little slivery smudge of stuff, that's the Green River Fossil beds, right? Fossil Butte there is that tiny little nubbin that is pointed out with that arrow. And underneath of it then are these massive, gigantic layers shown in green and blue. The green represents Paleozoic layers. The blue represents Mesozoic layers. These are layers that are recognized by nearly all creation geologists as being deposits in the flood. Not really open to question about that. These are, these, those are flood layers, that green and blue stuff. And then you also see these black lines running through it. Those are faults. Those are basically cracks in the rock. And you can see the layers are all distorted. They've been distorted a lot, and they've been distorted so much that they've cracked and shifted around. And so as we look at this, we can sort of begin to reconstruct how this whole area came to be what it is, right? So first, those layers were laid down in a basically a flat environment. Now, it wouldn't be perfectly flat, although it could be. There would be you know, margins to the deposits and that sort of thing. But here we have largely flat deposition because that's usually how deposition happens. Now, now this, again, is something that I would understand as deposited by the flood. Then at some point, all that continental movement and crashing together began to stress these layers so that they twisted and buckled and bent. And they bent and buckled and twisted so much that they cracked leaving this jagged landscape of broken, cracked rock layers. And then that landscape had to be shaved off and eroded. Flat, essentially flat. Not exactly entirely flat, but pretty flat. Leaving behind this kind of landscape, on top of which then you can put those Green River sediments that look like a lake. So now, the evolutionists would say, or the, the, the sort of conventional geologists would say that this took place over millions of years, right? That there was a very long period of time and a little bit of water working and a lot of energy and momentum from continental movements that caused this cracking and folding and erosion. And Steve Austin likes to say, you know, you can have a little water and a lot of time or a lot of water and a little time. And I think that makes a lot of sense to me here. We have these massively energetic changes happening that I would say are associated with the flood. Then you have that little smudge of brown stuff on the top, which looks to us people as being something really big and amazing, but in fact, turns out in the scale of the entire flood, turns out to be just a little bit of nothing. And it's very localized. So my understanding then would be after the flood, at some point, there was a lake, probably soon after the flood. And that lake was colonized by various creatures that migrated from Noah's Ark, uh, the land creatures and fish that came in any number of ways and colonized this lake. And it wasn't just an isolated lake, it was part of a larger big set of lakes that were part of the drainage system of the floodwaters and probably having to do with the large rainstorms that would have taken place consistently throughout the 
decades and centuries after the flood, the kinds of storms that would have eventually given us, we think, the Ice Age, all as a result of what's happening in the flood. And then the, as these things drained, they would empty into basins that would eventually drain out through the Grand Canyon. And again, it sort of all ties this creationist research together. The idea of the Green River Fossil Lake here, Fossil Butte National Monument, sort of drains out into the system that would eventually carve the Grand Canyon. Not Fossil Lake itself carving the Grand Canyon, but it's part of that larger system. Now you might still think, well, geez, how is this even possible then? How is it that you can have these exquisitely preserved fish in a thing that's just a lake, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think the answer there is that it doesn't make sense in our modern understanding of things because what we're seeing here is residual catastrophism. This idea that after the flood, it wasn't really over. There wasn't really an obvious after the flood other than the moment that Noah and company came off the ark. The flood continued to do regional, local inundations and catastrophes, big giant lakes that formed and then catastrophically drained throughout the decades and maybe even the centuries after the flood. This, I think, is an example of that. So this isn't just any old lake. This is a lake that was subject to a lot of pretty dramatic changes as the earth recovered from the flood. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the Green River Formation and this lake that formed after the flood, I invite you to check out this paper by my colleague and friend, Dr. John Whitmore. Dr. Whitmore is a geologist at Cedarville University, and he has studied the Green River Formation as part of his doctoral work and, and ongoing research, and he's written a great summary of the evidence for the lake deposit formation of the, these rock layers and the fossils in them. We'll have a link to this paper in the YouTube description so you can go right to it. So hey, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, leave us a like. Be sure to subscribe. Press that bell button if you want to be notified every time we uh, put up video. If you didn't like the video, which I noticed several people in the past couple of videos have not liked it at all, that's okay. Dislike the video. The more activity we get on our videos, the more YouTube thinks we're pretty terrific and shows us to other people. So thanks for that. Also, check out our website, coresci.org. There you will find links to our social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you'd like to interact with us, you can also find an email and a contact form there at coresci.org. And check out coresci.org slash donate. Make a contribution to help us continue making these videos available to you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.